All right. Okay. So, uh, Prabhu uh thanks for meeting with me today. I'm really excited to talk to you. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me, Samuel. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm glad to hear that. So, I wanted to start by saying that it is a privilege to speak interview. So, yeah, uh, I, I may want to do a short introductions about you, Professor Shari Irvin. So, a uh, professor at the University of Oklahoma, uh, Department of Philosophy. You're, you have done such influential work in aesthetic and philosophy, especially with your focus on body aesthetics, right? And uh, you're editing body aesthetics, writing uh, important pieces like resisting body oppression, an aesthetic approach, and many other more papers. And I feel you freely share this this discussions in this field. And again, I'm genuinely excited to dive into some of this topic with you today. Uh, so I just want to start with something more personal. So the first question is, what first drew you into philosophy? Was there a particular moment or topic that sparked it for you? You know, there were really kind of two moments. Mm -hmm. um, when I started college, I grew up in the state of Arizona, and I didn't know anything about philosophy, didn't know what the word meant, didn't know it existed. And I went to college and I was like, well, maybe I'll go to law school. I was, I engaged in high school debate. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed that. Law school seemed like a natural path. And I had heard that philosophy was a good major if you wanted to go to law school. So I took this introduction to philosophy class and it was a big class, it had hundreds of students, but I was just absolutely captured by this just analysis of ideas and consideration of arguments and objections and responses and analysis of texts. And it was just like a real fit for my way of thinking. And so I immediately was like, oh wow, this, you know, I'm kind of excited by this. And so I immediately went on to take a lot more philosophy classes. Uh -huh. But then I went to grad school, and grad school was kind of rough for a number of reasons. And I kind of left philosophy and went into psychology for a while. And I wasn't sure I would ever come back to philosophy and finish my PhD. But I started getting involved in the art world. And I was living in Canada at the time. And um, I started learning about and thinking about art and getting interested in some philosophical questions about the ontology of contemporary art. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately that led me back to philosophy, to uh -huh. think, hey, I wanna write about this. And so that has been another interest that has, uh, the philosophy of contemporary art that has kind of been a thread throughout my career. I see, so yeah, that's really interesting. So at the first time you aim for law school and then you end up, ended up uh, studying philosophy and then psychology and then you end up again with philosophy and for the past years uh, i think it's quite uh, how, how many years you've been in professors i have been at ou for 19 years uh -huh, yeah. and um then i taught at a couple of universities in canada uh -huh. before yeah. before coming to ou yeah so. so yeah you've passed so many years yeah mm -hmm. learning studying and <laughs> teaching philosophy so i interested what is so great about it? It, what's so good about philosophy? Like, is there something particularly captivating that you got engaged, that got you engaged early and has kept you there ever since? You know, I think, especially from my vantage point now, I really like to think about a lot of different kinds of things. I'm not the kind of person who finds one interest and just deeply pursues it. And actually for that reason, I wrote a book about the philosophy of contemporary art, mm -hmm. but I found that very difficult because of the just sustained attention I had to give to that one topic for so long to finish that book. But what I love about philosophy is I don't have a lab, I don't have equipment. <laughs> if I want to write about a different topic or think about a different topic, it's very easy to pivot to thinking about different things and to dig into different areas of philosophy and learn and bring together different interests. You know, there are ways in which aesthetics and epistemology come together, aesthetics and social philosophy, come together, aesthetics and feminist philosophy, aesthetics and philosophy of race, or sometimes all of those things. And I love the way that philosophy allows me to be nimble in exploring different kinds of interests. I see, yeah, so probably the way that it intersects with each other's subfields in philosophy itself makes you very interested with the way philosophy works. Am I right to say that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and mm -hmm. yeah, I remember that one of our one of my professors says 
philosophers has their li laboratory on their head. So yeah, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, we, we only need to come inside a room for hours mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we end up with some answers regarding our right. questions. Yeah. So yeah, so yeah. I'm finding so also that there's so much to appreciate about philosophy and that actually leads me into my next questions. So I'm in your aesthetics class right now and honestly uh, a lot of my friends in Indonesia know this as well that they never thought I'm gonna be interested with these topics in aesthetics so mm -hmm. I'm really captivated with this topic other than that you're a great teacher there's just so much to explore in aesthetics so what initially got you interested in aesthetics? Well, when I was living in Canada and I was kind of trying to figure out, you know, what I was going to do next professionally, I was working in some smaller contemporary art galleries and I was also doing some writing for the National Gallery of Canada. Mm -hmm. And it just got me really thinking about art, about the practices of making contemporary artworks, some of which have are really complex and can have different displays at different, like the display can be variable, reconfigurations and um, I got really interested in the metaphysics of that mm -hmm. and also in how we appreciate an artwork that doesn't have a fixed form that can appear in different manifestations. And so that kind of got me thinking, hey, I could look at that question from a philosophical perspective. I could write a dissertation on that. And that was, uh, I didn't know if I would ever actually then try to find a job in philosophy. I was really <laughs> uncertain that I wanted to do that. But that those questions about contemporary art kind of captivated me and propelled me back into philosophy. I see. Okay. Interesting. So speaking of your your work in aesthetics, mm -hmm. I also noticed that yeah, you wrote some things about uh, what's the role in contemporary arts, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But you also wrote and discussed about the body a lot in your uh, mm -hmm. writings, whether it's in body aesthetics and the paper that we read in class, uh, Resisting Body Oppression, and your 2022 works, Bodies, Functions, and Imperfections. So I wonder, like, people, usually people do not relate aesthetics with bodies. So I wonder how is the body relevant to aesthetics and what's the connection there? Yeah, um, traditionally, at least in the West, um, aesthetics and philosophy of art have focused on art and on experiences of nature, natural beauty. And that's been about it. Um, in the last several decades, there's been a turn toward what's known as everyday aesthetics, which is thinking about how we have aesthetic experiences in, in everyday life, in everyday interactions, not necessarily with art objects. And one of the things that's become clear is that we encounter each other, you know, like when I encounter you, it's by way of your embodiment, right? It's, uh, you know, online interactions are a little bit different, but when we're inter interacting in person, your embodiment is how I encounter you, and my embodiment is how you encounter me. And um, we have aesthetic reactions to each other's embodiment, and there's a lot of evidence that those um, affect how we treat each other. Mm -hmm. That, for example, judgments of attractiveness lead us to treat people better or worse. Also, it's clear that social hierarchies play up those tendencies. So. Um, social hierarchies um, and forms of oppression tend to try to shape negative aesthetic reactions to the bodies of people who they're positioning on lower rungs of a hierarchy mm -hmm. and shape positive aesthetic reactions to bodies of people they're trying to position higher. And so aesthetic responses um, are interwoven with power relationships mm -hmm. and um, social uh, hierarchy and forms of oppression. So I think it's very interesting to think about how it's both a very everyday part of how we encounter each other, but it is so fraught with um, these so sort of social and political ramifications. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very interested in the question of how do we disentangle that and how do we have a more um, open and inclusive and positive way of encountering each other aesthetically to defuse the role of body aesthetics and social hierarchy. Interesting, this is related as well to my next question. So uh, you sent uh, your recent work in choosing aesthetic practice wisely. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is related with uh, your answers. I wonder how aesthetics related to justice and before that, how do you see our aesthetic choices, practices, shaping broader social attitudes and values, particularly in terms of justice? 
Okay, so something in thinking about this problem, something that's become clear to me is that we have options to either accept the react the aesthetic responses that we happen to have mm -hmm. to people and things in the world, yeah. or to turn a critical eye on the aesthetic responses that we have to people, things, events, and to ask, does that aesthetic response that I'm having, what are the effects of that? Does that reflect my true deeper values? And we can choose to engage in practices of reshaping our aesthetic responses. And we already kind of know that this is an everyday phenomenon. Like people often, you know, when you're a little kid and you taste coffee for the first time, you might think that it's kind of bitter and gross, right? And then in adulthood, many of us come to really relish coffee. Same thing can happen with whiskey, right? It's kind of, you know, it's astringent, but you can come to enjoy a taste like that, that you first found unpleasant. And also some things that you once found really delightful um, like really sweet stuff. Apparently for kids, there's no limit to how sweet a thing can be, and they love it. But as adults, we kind of find it, if it's too sweet, we can kind of find it kind of gross, right? So we know that there are ways that our tastes can change. We also know that culturally, things change. Fashions change. The kinds of bodies that are appreciated most by a culture can change, sometimes quite quickly over a period of a decade or two. Um, and so there are levers for reshaping our tastes. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to be more conscious about, um, should we be using the levers that we have to change our tastes mm -hmm. in order to have different kinds of aesthetic responses mm -hmm. that then contribute to our ability to respond in more just ways and have more um, uh, sort of respectful relationships with the people that we encounter. Uh -huh. So yeah, I remember you mentioned something about aesthetic exploration as well as yeah. the mean to respect. Can you elaborate a bit about it uh, properly about aesthetic yeah. exploration? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, the way in, in a particular culture, there often are kind of standards of what counts as beautiful, what counts uh -huh. as ugly. Yeah. And if you ask people to rate faces, often they'll kind of converge on assessments of beauty and ugliness um, to a very considerable extent. And those are the kinds of judgments, like yes, it's fairly straightforward to make those judgments, but those are the judgments that play into these worries about um, people found unattractive tend to be subjected to social penalties in so many domains of life. So my suggestion is we need to move beyond those kinds of reactions. Oh, that's beautiful, I'm attracted to that face, I'm attracted to that body, that's so lovely, that's the kind of body or face that I wanna see in my environment oh, I find that body, that face ugly. I don't want to see that. I'm going to have a reaction of sort of looking away or grimace and even participate potentially in disciplining that person. You should cover yourself up. You shouldn't be in this space because I don't like seeing you here. And there have even been laws that do that. There were ugly laws in the U.S. that were enforced up to the 1970s, giving legal penalties to people found unsightly in public space. My thought is... Bodies are really rich, interesting, and complex objects. Every single human body is a system of flesh with texture and form and movement capability. And there's so much interesting stuff going on in any given human body. Can we let go of our attachment to beauty and ugliness? And can we explore other things about bodies that are just interesting and worthy of our attention and can we find ways to take pleasure in aspects of embodiment that normally we don't pay so much attention to or we have more automatic responses of attraction or disgust toward. So it's trying to sort of shake off some of those other reactions and find other kinds of affordances of the body that are worth engaging with. Wow, that's really interesting. And I know it's related with what you said earlier what's interesting about philosophy, the way it intersects with many uh, parts of self-discipline. So aesthetics, race, uh, philosophy of race, and justice, mm -hmm. and etc. So these are all very interesting, fascinating connection, but I need to wrap up. So mm -hmm. before I wrap up, we wrap up, I wanted to ask if you have any advice for any aspiring philosophers. I'd love to know what you think will be helpful for someone starting out. Mm -hmm. 
when you think of aspiring philosophers, who are you? Who are you thinking about? So my idea is someone who went to, let's say, going to the academia, mm -hmm. or someone who also maybe just want to start their undergraduate study, like high schoolers. Yeah. So yeah, mm -hmm. th that's my two kind of thing that I'm that in my head. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that philosophy offers incredible tools for looking at problems in new ways and being creative in solving those problems. And I think that it's really valuable to both keep an open mind to topics that you didn't know about and weren't sure you were interested in, like aesthetics. You found like, oh, actually, look at this. That yeah. is really interesting. But I think it's also important to notice when something is really sparking you. You're like, oh, there's something about this that I'm really interested in, I'm really excited about. And to leave yourself open to digging into the things that you're most, that you're most excited about. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, the going to, you know, studying and going to graduate school, it's a long journey. And sometimes people hear, oh, well, you know, if you work on this, it's better, it's more practical, there are more jobs. And it may be worthwhile to cultivate a specialization in an area where there are a lot of job prospects. But it's also important to do work that reflects who you are, work that you're excited about, where you can make an individual contribution because you have a perspective on that. And I think especially it's important to be yourself. So sometimes I get philosophy papers from people and it's like, for hundreds of years, philosophers <laughs> have been, and it's like a student who thinks that they're supposed to speak in a certain voice and mm -hmm. use a certain vocabulary yeah, yeah. that isn't theirs. They're trying to take on a persona that they believe is a philosopher persona. And I would say, we want you. You know, we want your voice. Mm -hmm. We want an individual's voice. We don't just want to hear a replication of philosophers have <laughs> said, you know, so, uh, you know, finding a way to be yourself and make your contribution is really important. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Prof. Urban, and I really enjoyed hearing about your journey and perspective, and that this has been inspiring, and I'm really grateful for your time. Yeah, well, it's great to talk to you, Samuel. Thank you so much for having me on your, um, and for interviewing me. Yeah, thank you.